one. Welcome everybody, this is Barry Doucette. I'm the CEO of Orangatech. We're on Teams Live and we wanna really welcome everybody. I like to say from the nation's capital, it's Orangatech Seminars Live. I also wanna thank and congratulate, and if you've heard me the last couple of weeks, congratulate the Government of Canada IT community. For the last four years I've been talking about, I've never seen the Government of Canada IT community as dialed in, as focused, as empowered, as engaged. And I would say the last seven months, you guys absolutely killed it. You've proved it to your departments, you've proved it to your clients, and obviously most importantly, you've proved it to the Canadian public. You've done a phenomenal job. I was talking to a deputy CIO yesterday. He talked about the long hours held by his IT team. And I've every CIO, every director, every DG, every person I've talked to have really told me about the efforts they put into it. So congratulations to you all. Great job. We're on Teams Live. Let me just do a little administrative. You can ask questions. We'll post those questions. And if you vote for them, uh, we'll ask those questions at the end. So we're gonna go through the presentation. And at the end, the presentation is 45 minutes. At the end, I will ask the questions and our presenter will answer those questions for you. So today we have Mr. John Paluzzo, who is the CTO public sector at AvPoint and the chief product officer for AvPoint. John's been with AvPoint for 10 years. He really knows the stuff. The great part, as I mentioned, he's also the CTO of public sector for AvPoint. The presentation is bottom up, top down, a layered approach to securing protected B in Microsoft 365. I want to turn it over to you, John. Again, thank you everybody for joining us. John, over to you. You're live. Yeah, thanks, Barry. And uh, pardon my uh, my screen off approach here. We're having some potential network issues. Um, so to save bandwidth, I'll keep my screen or my camera off, and hopefully we uh, we get through the slides pretty smoothly. Um, as Barry said, pleasure to be here. My name is John Peluso. I am a Microsoft Regional Director and the CTO of Avpoint Public Sector. Uh, recently also took on the mantle of um, Chief Product Officer here at Avpoint. Uh, you can see my, uh, my digits here up on the screen. If anything uh, sparks your interest and in, uh, a question surfaces later, feel free to reach out. Um, for those of you that are unfamiliar with Avpoint, Avpoint is a uh, global Microsoft ISV. Uh, we've been around since 2001. Um, we have customers across uh, many, many different countries and segments. Um, our cloud platform solution, Avpoint Online Services, uh, is currently supporting about 7 million um, Office 365 users across uh, management, governance, compliance, uh, and data protection. Um, our largest uh, area of business near and dear to my heart, our largest segment is our public sector segment. So um, what I'll try to do during the presentation today is be as uh, specific as we can about uh, maybe some customer stories that we have uh, to give example to some of the concepts that we'll talk about. Um, so the the topic of uh, note today is this this concept of uh, protecting sensitive data in a modern and rapid collaboration system. So we'll uh, first lay out kind of the problem or the the the, the space that we're looking to address here. Um, I'll set the tone right off the bat by saying that you know Avpoint was one of the the early Teams adopters. We run core components of our business on Teams, so we're big Teams fans. Um, but for any regulated industry, it is important that we understand how Teams works so that we can account for that in our management and governance approach. Um, we'll then talk a little bit about some of the out-of-box capabilities, some of the default settings, just some things that you do need to be aware of, and then we'll finish up with um, some potential solutions that we have helped customers uh, implement um, to address some of these areas. Uh, as Barry said, please do um, put your questions into the Q&A um, and we'll have time at the end to deal with them. All right, let's kick off. So um, I'm going to start with a few Microsoft slides. And, um, you know, this is a slide I believe that Jeff Teeper presented at the Inspire conference this year. 
Uh, if not, it was at the Ignite conference last year. And the whole idea here is to point out that Office 365 is really designed to be um, uh, a rapid and collaborative platform, right? The whole concept is about connections, getting folks the data and information that uh, they need to get their jobs done. We see this all throughout organizations. We see things like default sharing capabilities designed to um, be rapid and immediate. Um, we'll get into some of the defaults here, but exposure and access to information is critical um, for productivity. And this is, um, you know, at the end of the day, from a productivity standpoint, this is a good thing, right? Because information is now no longer locked into these tightly controlled silos where people can't get what they need to get their job done. So all good, right? All good from a from an aspirational standpoint. We're going to talk a lot about collaboration today. And um, what I thought we'd do to start is get away from technology and just talk about collaboration as a concept. So in this case, team collaboration. So if we go all the way back and we take uh, the technology out of it, a team is really nothing more than a collection of people that have some functional reason to work together. Um, that could be a long-standing reason, like uh, they're part of the same department or agency. Um, this could be short-term collaboration, like we're engaged in a particular project or a particular initiative. Um, this could be uh, all folks that are within the organization, folks that are within the same building, or this could be folks that are spread out and varied, right? So um, at the end of the day, the team, lowercase t team, right? Not on Microsoft team, um, starts with a functional group of people. We need to define that functional group of people. And then we need to acknowledge the fact that that functional group of people will require tools and will create artifacts of their collaboration. Um, what's the first thing that happens uh, in most projects as an example? Well, the first thing that happens is we probably have a kickoff meeting. We're going to set the stage about what needs to be accomplished. We're going to set out some tasks and some goals and some objectives, right? Um, one of those tasks uh, or several of those tasks might involve creating deliverables, um, presentations, documents, things like that, right? All the byproducts of uh, a project. Um, we're going to have communication, sometimes more formal communication uh, broadly outside this team, but we're also going to have a lot of rapid and ad hoc conversation amongst the team, right? And so different kinds of conversations will be happening. And as we'll see increasingly uh, in this uh, past what, six months, um, the social engagement component, which had already been evolving from folks that sit next to each other, right, to increasingly people that are dispersed in different offices, in different countries, in different time zones, in different uh, uh, provinces, maybe. Um, the social engagement becomes key, especially in a work from home scenario, getting to know your peers, having some social relationship outside of just trading of business topic information. And so how does Microsoft approach this, right? Uh, because this is not specific to a technology. This is the concept of teamwork. Microsoft now for a, a series of years since uh, 2014 has had this concept of Office 365 groups as an answer to this uh, collaboration reality. And really what an Office 365 groups presents um, are uh, ways to solve exactly what we just talked about. First off, a group is an identity. Right. So remember, we had that functional group of people that we needed to uh, uh, define as a team. Well, now I have a place to do it. Azure Active Directory is the directory for Office 365 and an Office 365 group is a new Azure Active Directory object type. We can define the membership of that group. Now, because these groups are uh, increasingly spinning up faster and faster and faster, um, and you may be part of some groups today and other groups tomorrow, what Microsoft decided to do was take a bit of a change from the way Active Directory worked before, where admins were the only ones that could create Azure Active Directory objects. Now, the default in Office 365 is that any user can create one of these groups, right? And we'll talk about the different kinds of groups later. Um, federated resources. 
So um, remember all those artifacts of collaboration, the documents and the and the tasks and things like this. Microsoft is providing services like Teams, like Outlook, right, like SharePoint, like Planner to service all of those particular needs. And then finally, there's a loose coupling between the resources and the identity, meaning when the identity is created, someone creates a group, they will automatically get the resources. And that's through this loose coupling of services between um, the Azure Active Directory group getting created and signals going out to SharePoint to provision a site, to Exchange to provision an, a mailbox, um, to Planner to provision Planner, things like this, all associated with that group. Um, again, I think uh, we can move pretty quickly through this, but here's another Microsoft slide, which I think uh, bears a little bit of um, in um, time on talking about uh, the landscape of collaboration has changed even before the pandemic it was changing, but the pandemic really put us into overdrive and we see a lot of digital transformation in terms of how people are working. I know at Avpoint, especially with our government customers, um, you know, they were taking prior to the spring of this year, they were taking a very kind of measured twice cut once approach. Oh, we may have, you know, um, 500 um, uh, users on teams in the next six months, and then we'll roll it out to a larger group, and then we'll lower, roll it out to a larger group. But yeah, we'll probably have everybody on teams by 2022, right? That turned into, I got to get everybody on teams by Monday because they need to work, they can't access their data, everybody's working from home. So there's no question that the pandemic has increased uh, this, uh, the rapidity of this uh, transformation. And largely, uh, you know, that byproduct, while it comes from a, a horrible cause, um, means that we now have modernization in more places in government um, than we've had, and at a faster pace than we've had to now. Um, so there is a silver lining, right? Because we now have equipped lots of our government workforce with more modern collaboration tools in the form of things like Microsoft Teams. Now, to drill in a little bit into the technology piece of this, as I mentioned earlier, it's important to remember that with this group model for Office 365, um, there are some familiar players that you probably know about. SharePoint is the file storage, the default file storage for all Office 365 groups. And because Office 365 groups are really the foundation for Microsoft Teams, that means that all of your Teams files are also stored in SharePoint. This one is going to become important for the remainder of our presentation. Um, there is also an Exchange mailbox. So when you send channel conversation messages, uh, when you send one-to-one -one or one-to-few chats in the Teams interface, what's actually happening in the background is Microsoft is storing all of those messages, a compliance copy of all of those messages in the Exchange mailbox. If it's a team, it's, it's that those messages are stored in the Exchange mailbox that is provisioned with the team. If they are personal one-to-one -one chats or one-to-few chats, those messages are stored in the personal mailboxes of the folks involved in the chat. They don't see them, right? It's a compliance copy, so the, the users can't really see or delete them, uh, but they're there. This matches very nicely because now I have best of breed, retention, DLP, um, uh, compliance, legal hold, e-discovery, uh, really everything I have for Exchange and everything I have for SharePoint can now be brought to bear. All of those compliance tool, uh, all that compliance tooling can be brought to bear, which is great. Right, and then I get other services that are available to the group like planner for task management, stream for video sharing and and who knows what's next, right? So continuing to add new services um, to the platform. Again, just to punch the point about uh, SharePoint being the file storage for um, for these files uh, that are associated with a team. Here what I have on the left hand side is a team called BG leads and then all of the channels, teams channels that live in that team. And you can see that there's a one to one mapping between the teams channel and folders that live in the SharePoint site that was provisioned for the team. So uh, it's a pretty straightforward mapping. And the cool thing is that there's really nothing for us to do. Teams automatically creates the site when the team is created um, and teams will automatically create these folders for each channel 
um, when the channels are created. Now, the one thing you don't see in here, for those of you that are a little bit more advanced, um, private channels uh, data are also stored in SharePoint, uh, but private channels get their own uh, SharePoint uh, site associated, and that's to segment that content. Um, okay, so let's keep moving. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to launch into a, a, essentially a screenshot tour where what I'm going to do is, is talk a little bit about how files and file sharing works through Teams and by extension in SharePoint. And what we're going to do is point out um, the ability for uh, organizations to understand what kind of activity is happening here and what is not. Now, when I walk you through this, it may sound a little bit scary, <laughs> but it is not. Trust me, we'll, if you get a little bit scared on the way, um, we will put you back together at the end of the presentation here, all right? So, um, as I mentioned, all files that are uploaded to Teams um, are actually stored in SharePoint or by extension OneDrive. So here's an example of a user who is in a one-to-one -one chat, um, uploads a file. That file actually goes into their OneDrive into a folder called Microsoft Teams chat files and is shared with the other members of the chat, right? So that's how a chat file works. A conversation file works similarly, except it goes into the um, SharePoint site that backs the team right, and therefore is automatically available to everyone else in the team. Um, now, the provisioning, the self-service provisioning, uh, how do I get a new group, I guess is the question, right? Um, and for, a, for an end user, really that is as easy as uh, coming down here to join or create a team and clicking on create team. Right, and when I do that, I get an option called public or private. Um, and again, this is the default. The default, as I said, in Office 365 is that any user that can, uh, that needs a team can create one. Remember, behind this, a group will be created, an Office 365 group, and that's just how they connect with each other. So this decision of private versus public um, really uh, is a fundamental one. Now, if I choose a public team, the idea here is that this is a group that anyone in the company can join without any kind of process or approval. They can see it as they search, they can um, click a join button, and now they're a member of the team. Private works the way that you would expect, right? Private team is not visible to anyone who's not in the team. And uh, if, uh, let's say, a member of the team wants to invite someone else, an owner of that team would have to approve it. There's a little uh, mechanism to know that a, a, a new member has been requested and an owner can click on accept. Now, if I pick a public team, because again, remember as a business user, I may not be all that sophisticated about these differences. If I pick a public team, not only does it mean that anyone in the organization can join, if you go to the SharePoint site that gets provisioned with a public team, in this case, remember it's also a public group, you'll see something very interesting in the site members group. So um, for those of you that uh, are old SharePoint folks, this is old hat, but if you're not a SharePoint person, it can get a little bit confusing because we've been talking up to now about an Office 365 group. Remember, this is the defined identity of the group of people you're collaborating with. Um, it lives in Azure Active Directory. SharePoint also gives permission on the basis of groups, but they are groups that are specific to SharePoint. So you can see here that relationship. I've got a team here that I'm going to call my public team. And once I create my public team, which is the name of the Office 365 group, hence the name of the team, you'll see that here are the members of that my public team group. And you can see they happen to be put into the site members group in SharePoint, meaning they have your basic contribute and edit rights for all files having to do with that team. And that makes sense. That is the model of how Teams works. But if the team is public, we see an extra entry here, which is everyone except external users. Um, and this is a reflection of the fact that if the group or the team is public, the intention is that the data and the information they're creating and working on is not 
uh, has no need to be secured from the rest of the organization. So this means anyone in the organization has the, the ability to see, and because they're in the members group, also edit that information. So public versus private might be something that you want to keep an eye on, right? And we were, and as we saw in our quick demo here, right? If you don't do anything, you don't put any kind of management in process, you're going to leave it up to the user about what they pick. So that's one example of how easy it can be um, to have oversharing in Office 365. Um, here's another example. Um, classically, uh, in the old days, SharePoint sites uh, had owners, right? And owners were the ones who decided who had access and who didn't have access to the content within that particular SharePoint site. When Microsoft launched Office 365, in the interest of, again, a, a, a faster and more rapid sharing model, what they did was decide that was uh, too limiting. And it was, right? Uh, I can't tell you how many times in the old days someone would send me a link to a file. I wouldn't have access to the file. It was extraordinarily frustrating, right? And so um, what Microsoft has done is actually set the default for all net new SharePoint sites, including those that are created with Teams, so that the Non-owners, the folks with edit rights, do have the ability to share files and folders with people who may not already have access within the organization, right? This works really well when you go and attach a link to an email. You are intending the people who are receiving the email to be able to access the file, right? So there's intention there. Why should you have to worry about SharePoint permissions as a business user, right? The system should automatically understand what you're trying to do. Now, from a compliance standpoint, from a managed standpoint, um, we may want to pay attention to this, right? Um, and so this may be something else that we want to account for. Um, another thing which has been extraordinarily useful from a productivity standpoint, I use it probably 10 times a day, I would say, on average, is this ability to share right from inside my Office documents, right? I'm in a Word document, I click share, and I get these settings, right? What kind of link do you want to create? This is essentially SharePoint technology, and if I'm my OneDrive, I will see the same thing because this uh, the same uh, technology that powers SharePoint uh, powers OneDrive. And so I can share for any files that are from my OneDrive or from or stored in any SharePoint site in Office 365. And then depending upon how the organization has configured the default sharing links, um, I may have one or more of these options right as a default. People um, in the company with the link, um, people with existing access, or specific people. So again, there's a lot of deliberate sharing activity here. Um, if we take this apart even further, let's remember that this connects now to what we saw before, which is we want people to be able to uh, share and collaborate on the information that they want. We want that from a business and productivity side, right? And so the fact now that this action, the sharing action, can be initiated not just from folks who own the OneDrive or own the SharePoint site that this file sits in, but anybody with edit access, remember, can initiate this sharing process, right? So we have the ability here to uh, share in many different ways. Now, from an organizational standpoint, this can create some challenges if we're in an in a administration or a security role, because uh, it's one thing to share content with specific people, right? I know who has that content, I know who has access, but if what the user decides to create, and, and this is something I do myself many, many times within Avpoint is say, look, this information, it's relatively mundane. It's okay. I don't care who gets my presentation. As long as they're inside Avpoint, it's okay for me. So I'm going to give Nick the the all Avpoint link. This way, whoever he forwards it to will also have access, right? So this is not an uncommon thing in a traditional collaborative scenario. The downside to this people in the company with the link is that it's not mapped to a person, right? So what if this document evolves over time? And I decide, hey, you know what? Now this information isn't so mundane. There is a little bit of, of uh, sensitivity to it. I still have that link that's sitting out there that is not mapped to any particular user or role. It's just an, an open all company link, right? And that leads to this concern, right? Who is sharing what with who? That's really what we need to know. 
Um, and if you think about things like the surge in Teams usage that we talked about, um, this becomes even more important because you're not going to be able to worry about chasing every single file. We want to know that we have the ability to understand this. And so another complexity here is that uh, what you see as far as access rights does depend where you look. If we look in SharePoint, right, there is a site permissions report. And in that site permissions report for a team, we will see, in this case, my team name is BG Leads. So I can see that the BG Lead owners are in the SharePoint owners group, makes perfect sense. And I can see that the BG Leads members are in the members group. That makes perfect sense either. Uh, also, right, so edit rights owner rights. But then we also see that there's something called advanced permissions settings because there's additional people with access to the site. Now we're going to come back to this one because what does that actually mean? We'll talk about that. If we take the same action from, let's say, um, the Exchange mailbox and I look at the BG Leads team from the Exchange mailbox, it's going to show me the members, right? Members and owners. There's no mention of this advanced permissions here, right? And why not? Well, let's find out. Again, owners and members, no problem, right? This is the, uh, the exchange view. But if we go back and we drill into that advanced permission settings, what we find out is that remember, SharePoint is still SharePoint. So for those of you that know this SharePoint technology, um, understand that it is still possible to assign SharePoint only permissions even to private teams content by not adding to the, them to the team, but using the sharing capabilities directly within SharePoint. And that's what SharePoint is telling me here. Some of the content on this site has different permissions, right, than just what's in the group or team. And so if I drill even further in, into that, what I can find is sure enough, different objects within the SharePoint site have unique permissions. This is known as breaking permission inheritance because where groups and teams define security at the team and group level, right? SharePoint can define permissions all the way down to the individual content level. So if I come back over here and I share this one document using this sharing link, right? What I'm gonna do is actually set permissions on that document specifically and therefore it'll show up as a piece of content that has unique permissions right um, it's not always uh, super intuitive as well for especially for end users to understand who has access to what here's a permissions check from the sharepoint interface for one of these same sites you can see st i'm still in my bg lead uh, group team site and it's somewhat confusing, right? So for users to be able to understand what's going on here can get very complicated. Now, again, good thing and bad thing. You don't wanna have to add someone to an entire group and access all of the group content just because you want them to see a single piece of content, right? That's oversharing in another direction. Um, so it is great that we have this ability to share broadly or narrowly all the way down to a single document, but the management of this is where it can be difficult, right? Also, when we're sharing with groups or even those anonymous links, it's hard to know who actually will have access to that. Now, um, everything I've been showing you about reporting on these permissions is uh, reporting uh, team site by team site, SharePoint site by SharePoint site, OneDrive by OneDrive. And that is because of the decentralized um, administration model that SharePoint has had for a long, long time, right? In SharePoint, each, call, what's called a site collection, which is essentially what you get when you get a new team. You get a team and a site collection that backs the team. Again, notwithstanding private channels, which uh, com complicates matters a little bit more, but we'll stay at this level for the moment, right? So I get a new group, that means I get a new site collection. I get a team, I get a site collection. All of the security reporting about what links exist, right, and what specific permissions exist are reported and live at that site collection level. And as you, over time in the organization, get more and more of these site collections, and the, the, the limit now Microsoft has raised 
uh, last year, late last year, they raised the limit per Office 365 tenant from 500,000 site collections to 2 million. Okay, 2 million. Um, there is no centralized roll up reporting through the Office 365 interface for all this stuff, right? So, um, Document by document, fairly easy to see who has permissions and what links exist. Site collection by site collection, a little bit more difficult, but the reporting is there. But there is no centralized way to do this across your entire organization. Okay. Um, when it comes to visibility for admins, you have some, some very good tooling in the Office 365 admin centers. There is a Teams admin center. That's what this is, right? And what this gives me the ability to do is manage Teams. So remember my team that had 20 uh, people and was showing me the members and the owners. Unfortunately, this is only show me, showing me the team and the team members. Remember, any SharePoint explicit permissions will only be visible through SharePoint. They won't be reported here in the Teams Admin Center. Teams Admin Center, I'll see all the membership of the Office 365 group. If I go over to the SharePoint Admin Center, right, I have a, a pretty positive thing. Look, I have something here called permissions. Unfortunately, this is just managing the owners and additional admins of each of these sites, right? It's not gonna show me everybody. If I click sharing, it's going to show me the sharing options, not necessarily the, um, the specific uh, permissions. So the bottom line here is that at the end of the day, um, owners have a lot of privilege in Office 365. They can delete their content anytime they want. They can delete a group or a team which deletes everything in the team. Um, so there's a lot of privilege that owners have that in uh, several of my government customers uh, makes this a little bit difficult to square with some of the regulatory or compliance processes that they're familiar with. Um, I have several both government contractors uh, as well as government agencies where a significant amount of the content in their tenant is completely fine to be openly shared. But a mod, but a, uh, a, my, a minority of that content has to be tightly controlled, right? So how do we have that kind of uh, variable approach to the content that uh, we are working with in Office 365? Um, also, uh, we lack the, the the monitoring for this kind of tenant-wide ability. Um, to manage these kinds of issues. And so what we want to do, the way forward, I said, let, you know, let's put you back together. The way forward is to right size the control that you have, right? Not over uh, you know, overly draconian measures of locking everybody down. That is not the right solution by far, but you do have a responsibility, right? To protect your sensitive data in accordance with your uh, governance and compliance policies. So how are we going to do this? Well, we do get some tools uh, both from Microsoft, and we will also get into some additional supplemental tooling that Avpoint uh, has brought to market. But let's talk about this idea of governance for a moment. And this is where we're going to get into the theme of this um, presentation, which again is uh, bottom up and top down, right? And so if we look at an overall governance strategy uh, for an organization, your IT governance is really an outgrowth of your uh, agency governance, uh, you know, organization-wide broad governance that then gets interpreted into how we handle um, our electronic data and collaboration, right? And at Avpoint, we find it valuable to break this down into what we call an operational governance model and a data governance model. The operational governance model, think about it like uh, what we're calling here container level governance, meaning I know the collaboration spaces that I have. I have a high degree of confidence about what kind of collaboration is happening in there, who is collaborating in there, and therefore I can make some pretty good bets on the kinds of controls and governance I need to apply. Okay, so for one of my government contractors, what that means is I know that this is a workspace that is going to deal with um, technical plans and data. Um, for uh, equipment that will be sold to the military. And therefore that needs to be protected. 
So I'm going to apply very tight controls around that particular container. Whereas another, let's say, team, which has nothing to do with that uh, topic, right? Maybe it's just for um, internal, uh, um, you know, uh, um, uh, service delivery improvement initiatives, right? That does not need that kind of level of, of scrutiny or control. As a matter of fact, we want that collaboration to move quickly because we want to bring that value to the business. So again, this operational governance is about knowing what you have. And as one of my um, one of my um, U.S. government customers said, I have 68 agencies all collaborating in the same Office 365 tenant. I can't chase every document, so I have to have a container level view of what is probably going on. Right. Then down at the content level, this is where we're protecting every single document. Right. Um, and ideally, these two work together. So content level governance is things like encryption, data security, retention, records management, DLP. Right. Things that protect the content level. And they're related to each other. Right. So when I said I have a high degree of knowledge that there will be sensitive collaboration here, what am I going to do? I am going to lock down the content there. Maybe I put it under retention. Maybe I have strict DLP policies there. Maybe I'm doing, um, you know, a significant amount of um, encryption on documents so that they can't be uh, those documents can't spill where they're not supposed to be spilled, right? And then what I, the only thing I have to do now, once I have this approach of, again, top down, bottom up, um, all I now have to do is worry about where do I have content that may be sensitive that is living in containers that it's not supposed to be, okay? And so how do we get insights there? Um, in essence, this is what we want to know. Where, what is the access all about? Who has the access? What are they doing with it? and how sensitive is the data. That's really what we want to know as part of this uh, initiative. Now, Microsoft does bring, depending upon the license levels that you have in Office 365, there's various tooling that Microsoft brings to you which helps in these efforts. The first is uh, this concept of sensitive information types. This is the most basic level. And even if you haven't yet set up a DLP policy, even if you haven't even begun an initiative yet for things like sensitivity labeling, right, which is an advanced capability. Microsoft is already assessing your content against certain out of the box classifiers, right? And that's happening in the background without any action from you. The good news is if you can tap into that, you can automatically get a sense of where some of your uh, most easily identifiable sensitive information is stored. And again, Microsoft is already doing this. Um, you can do content searches and simply say, hey, I want to look in certain areas and find uh, content that meets a particular condition, like it meets the sensitive information type that's out of box called credit card number, right? Microsoft also gives you audit log reporting, right? So very rich auditing from a single source. You don't have to go chase exchange and chase SharePoint, right? Centralized audit reporting uh, you have here. The challenge, and the challenge has always been, how do I put that stuff together in a way that makes sense? And that's really what Avpoint's bringing to uh, market with our policies and insights product. The whole point of policy and insights is to help you find and prioritize the content that is most likely to be overshared and begin to prioritize how to approach that, right? Um, Policies and Insights is a tool that is designed for your um, centralized admins and compliance teams, as well as uh, any divisional admins and compliance teams that you may have, right? Not an end user tool, but really for the folks that are looking broadly across the, um, the, the tenant or across their own division within that tenant. Um, the tool also allows you to monitor and fix for what we call drift right, drift of uh, permissions that may not be in accordance with policy, configurations that may not be in a, accordance with policy, et cetera. And then prevention. There may be even activities that I can prevent from happening in the first place. Again, through a definition of policy and uh, proactive monitoring. Now the policies and insights uh, interface is divided into two um, different um, uh, components. 
policies, which is uh, reporting and uh, sorry, insights, which is reporting and policies, which gives us the actionable uh, plans. So things like where do I have sensitive data? Where do I have those anonymous links? And the whole idea here is to be able to provide a prioritized risk rating. So let me pop very quickly into uh, a policies and insights um, demonstration environment and see a couple of these practices in action. So let's go over to here, pull up a different environment. And uh, policies, again, it, what's what's really cool about the pol or policies and insights is it's a very simple um, uh, process. There's no, not a lot of planning that you have to do here. You don't have to have any elevated um, uh, Office 365 SKUs. Um, and you literally turn the capability on. We start collecting information about your permission activity, your uh, sensitive information activity, and from there, uh, you are able to take action. While that builds up, let me just show you a couple of things here. One of my favorite areas of the um, insights application is the exposure section. So remember all those things that were difficult for us to find before because they're spread out. Um, in the back end, what we're doing is actually caching uh, all of the permissions through all of those SharePoint sites so that they're available to you at the click of a button. Uh, before you, what you would have to do is again run through every one of those SharePoint sites, certainly manually, but that's not really support. You know, not a not a functional way to do it. Or you could run scripts, but those scripts are going to take a long time to run, right? So because we're caching all this information with the click of a button, you're going to be able to get access to things like where do I have anonymous links? Are they set to expire? What is the sensitivity level of each of those? Um, anonymous links and I can go in here and I can take action like undoing the link or setting an expiration date for the link. Now again, I'm probably going to have a lot of this stuff when we run this internally. We've run this at uh, at customers um, and what happens is of course you're going to have a lot of things here that seem to be uh, potentially risky. So the ability to come in and filter for just the kind of things that you want are really how we're going to start drilling in and having a strategy go forward, right? So I can see all sensitivity levels or drill into certain ones. Um, I can look for a particular user. This is another request that compliance and admin teams get all the time. Hey, show me everything that Murugan has access to. Okay, where, right? Across everywhere, just in the OneDrive just in uh, in all workspaces. And when we return that result, we're going to help you rank the uh, risk overview based on the factors that you've defined. So speaking of which, let's get into insights. And I apologize for the slowness. I'm on my phone right now. My home internet has uh, <laughs> has not been cooperating for this uh, session. So um, we may take a little bit of time to load here. And while we're doing that, again, let's get back to the um, some of the screenshots. So this ability to rank the priority of these events, um, the ability to view the permissions of any of these content that I find as a result of my Muragon search, and also then view all of the audit history, because not only am I collecting the permission information, but we're also aggregating all of that information for all of these files um, directly from the Office 365 audit logs. So now I can see who did what with those files. All right? And this is available from any of our reporting interfaces here in Insights. So you can see it really helps to bring together the um, access reports, the audit reports, um, and uh, some, some um, uh, level of risk assessment. So again, here's my insights dashboard and let's just take a look in teams as an example. Um, and again, this is reporting across whatever scope of the Office 365 tenant or tenants that we've asked it to look at. 
And so I can see here I've got five external users. Uh, I've got eight anonymous links. I've got 45 sensitive items. Um, and the cool thing is that you can decide what determines sensitivity and exposure, right? So if I want to define my high exposure level versus my medium versus my low, I can base it on whatever criteria I want. Right? If I come back up to my Teams dashboard here and we drill in, let's say we want to define these anonymous links. All right, so there you go. Here's all the anonymous links across all containers. But if I wanted to, I can drill into just a subset. So let's say I have um, divisions within my Office 365 tenant that reflect the divisions within a government agency. Um, we can help you create those divisions in the software and then help you drill into just um, the appropriate containers um, using the tooling here. Again, I can see all the various information. I can decide um, what to do with this thing. Um, I can see if it's tagged as a sensitive information type, what it triggered, and you can see all the same things that I had in my slide. The other cool thing here is that if you happen to have a more structured approach to security and you're using some of the advanced Microsoft security tools like the Microsoft Information Protection Labels, um, the Insights application will be able to take that into account as well. Because something that seems overexposed but is protected by a sensitivity label um, may be rated at lower risk than something that is less exposed but not protected by a label. So we can factor this into your strategy. Now, one of the things that government customers tell me all the time is that while it's great, it's kind of the, the holy grail to be able to automatically assess sensitive content, there are times when uh, you just need the input of a user. And so it's great to be able to find where you have content that the system suggests might be sensitive and then be able to gauge whether or not a user did go ahead and apply the sensitivity label to it. So again, just trying to bring you the insights um, that are difficult to gather centrally. So that's one thing, that's the policies application. And the companion to that is the, uh, the policy component. So we have insights before, this is policy. The ability to set um, automatic protections so that if we encounter any drift from things like people that shouldn't be sharing with each other, people that shouldn't be in the same team with each other, um, removing guest accounts when they no longer log in for a period of time, or removing guest accounts when they no longer are a member of any groups or teams or sites. These are the kinds of things that we can do with the policies application. And again, it's gonna give you similar cross-tenant visibility of violations, you can drill in on those violations, find out what's wrong. And in many cases, depending upon the violation, uh, there's a, either an automatic fix that you can enable or a single button fix. So in this case, I had external sharings that were supposed to be set a particular way. Here I found a particular team uh, that those settings were changed on, and I can either automatically revert those changes or have a push button fix if I wanna have some manual intervention there. Um, so bottom up, content level, this policies and insights application is going to help you to get that um, granular view of content within the organization and what's happening with it. Um, and most importantly, give you that cross-tenant visibility of risk and oversharing. Top down, the AppPoint Cloud Governance solution really is all about operational management for the provisioning management and life cycle of, these, uh, of your Office 365 groups teams, sites, guest users, right? A lot of these um, core collaborative services. What the, uh, the uh, uh, cloud governance application is gonna give you the ability to do is define different kinds of workspace policies. Those can be mapped to department. Those can be mapped to um, uh, purpose, right? And so what you can do is so that if I know that, for example, uh, Department B never handles federally regulated information, right, um, or government regulated information, um, they can have long-term uh, workspaces, they can have any kind of workspace they want, um, and uh, they only have to perform recertification activities on permissions every six months. But if Department A regularly handles more sensitive information, right, 
that department can be treated differently. So this gives you the ability to vary the service delivery within a single Office 365 tenant. Now, when it comes to um, really understanding your collaborative landscape, this is where the, the cloud governance solution really shines as well. Whether it be during the provisioning of a new object, let's say you're going to use the AvPoint provisioning. Um, not only are we going to give you the ability to set certain defaults there, you can also define additional governance attributes that you want to collect um, for each of your collaborative workspaces. If you want to use native provisioning, let's say you have a, an alternate provisioning process, you don't want to use us for provisioning, that's no problem because we have this import capability that can reach out and say, hey, I noticed you created a workspace yesterday. Good news, great, hope you're doing well. By the way, uh, right? Uh, agency policy is that within seven days, you've got to supply this critical business information, right? So whether you get it through provisioning or on import, no problem. And then the cloud governance application, one of the capabilities is to be able to require over time that the responsible parties for each workspace attest to the fact that they're still willing to be the owner of that thing. There's still a business relevance for it, right? Um, they can be required to go through a periodic recertification, renewal and attestation process, right? Where they confirm they're the owner, they're able to quickly and easily review both the SharePoint native permissions as well as the group ownerships, uh, group memberships rather, and then through any metadata renewal. Um, on the back side, all of this is fully auditable by admins through their own interface, right? So again, your full collaboration landscape with a full understanding of what's going on at every step of the way. And again, this is supported for all the different object types, uh, sites, groups, teams, et cetera. Um, and uh, as of earlier this year, we support even the onboarding, management, and end of life of guest users as well through the same process. So very flexible, um, very flexible approach. Um, let me go ahead and pause there because I'm at the end of my core presentation. So um, Barry, do we have any questions here that we want to we, we want to do? Handle? Thank you. I, I was about to say I need to be a taskmaster. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Um, you know, I, I'll go to the question that's got the most vote, most votes, and you can help us with and we know the answer. Any Canadian federal departments leveraging have point product for their M365 implementation for securing their data to protect it be. And I would say, Sonny, thank you for asking that question. You're always asking the tough ones, Sonny. So I appreciate that. Right now, the answer is no. But John, perhaps you could talk to us who in the uh, US or, or even in uh, public sector period who are doing that. Yeah. Great. Yeah, we do have. Uh, yep. So, so um, my uh, engagement, field engagement, has been mostly in North America public sector over the last uh, few years. So, I can tell you that uh, the Department of State um, owns this solution. Uh, the Department of Energy, U.S. Department of Energy, Federal Department of Energy, um, is actually acting as our FedRAMP sponsor. So, in uh, the U.S all cloud solutions have to be FedRAMP authorized in order to be uh, used by the federal government. Um, and we're uh, at the end of that process with a sponsor of Department of Energy. Um, the US courts are using this solution. Um, and then there's lots and lots of, uh, in, in what the US we refer to as our state and local governments. So um, several of our states, um, in Minnesota, in California, in New Jersey, um, are using this solution to bring this kind of structured, managed um, self-service approach to their Office 365. Super. Somebody asked about many government of Canada agencies are mandated to use different information management systems. How do we integrate that with SharePoint? I did respond to that, John, just so you know. I hope everyone ex uh, appreciates the response. Uh, Orangatech knows the GC docs uh, extremely well. As I've said, we've done numerous, numerous proof of concepts pilots for SharePoint, the GC Docs, whether it's on-prem, in Azure, or in Microsoft 365. By all means, reach out to us and we could uh, walk through that. Um, Anonymous, how is a new cap how new is the capability of, of a user being able to create a group? John, I think that's been around a long time, right? Yeah, yeah that, that's ever since Office 365 groups yeah. were created, it's always been the default, yep. That's exactly what I thought as well. Can you speak about the relationship between compliance boundaries and groups? Uh, sure. So there's there's 
so there's a couple of components here with uh, with compliance boundaries and groups and another technology that's called information barriers. So there's 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 a lot of this going on. In in essence, compliance boundaries um, by name, if you're if you're talking about quote compliance boundaries unquote, are really about um, creating divisions within an Office 365 tenant for the purposes of e-discovery. So if I want to have an e-discovery admin that is only capable of performing e-discovery searches against agency A, uh, for example, I can set up a compliance boundary. Those compliance boundaries, though, are going to be largely based on people, right? So um, if people have attribute A, B, or C, then they will be able to search uh, across people with those attributes. It's normally not used for shared workspaces because it is so hard natively to map those back to you know, what division or department actually owns them. Um, information barriers is a separate technology, right, where compliance boundaries are, are e-discovery focused. Information barriers are a, a relatively new technology that Microsoft has for situations where people in one uh, uh, faction of the organization should never, ever be able to interact with people of another. Largely, you see this uh, in financial services uh, companies where that where they're just all all communication between uh, brokers and dealers, let's say, should never happen. So that's the hard thing with information barriers. They do have application in teams, um, uh, in exchange, et cetera, because it, what it does is it filters the people picker so that if I don't ever have the right to talk to Barry, I can't see Barry in any people picker, right? Um, and that's how they work. The, the, the challenge is in a lot of government organizations that I deal with, the boundaries are not that permanent. Sometimes it's okay for me to talk to Barry and sometimes it's not. It all depends on what we're talking about. Super, thank you so much. And someone asked a question, can you share this presentation deck? That's fully our intent. Yeah. We'll most likely launch it on our website and ask everyone to pick it up. We'll let you know. We will also be publishing uh, this presentation, the video of it on, on YouTube and we'll send that out to everybody. Um, I'm trying to go so go through these. <laughs> How do you change a private channel to a public channel? Great question. I wish I had an answer to it, but the reason I have don't have an answer is because you can't, unfortunately. Um, channel types are set at uh, at the time of creation, and there is no time to no no ability to change a private channel to a standard channel. Now, um, if I read the the terms that are using that question, I'll answer a a, a question that you're not asking, which is, can you change a private team to a public team and a public team to a private team? That you can do after the fact. So that would change the whole team. What I would say is if you are changing those public teams uh, to private teams, I would take the extra step of taking a look and making sure that that everyone except external users entry does get removed from the members group in SharePoint. Super, and, and loving the answers from Nick. Thank you. Does, does the provisioning pro process only in English or does it support both French and English? Yes, it does, and German and many other. Thank you, Nick, yeah. for that. Uh, is there an API for Avpoint? Yes, absolutely, yes. And, and Nick's provided that. Um, I'm almost through all the questions, trying to see if I've missed anything. Um, does, I'm, I'm appalled, I almost feel bad about this one. <laughs> OneDrive storage is also using SharePoint, correct? I can say that definitely MS Teams, if everyone knows, in the background is SharePoint. Sorry, John, is OneDrive storage also using SharePoint? It is, it's the same technology. Uh, and you can see that if you go into your OneDrive, if you poke around at some of the settings, you can even create a subsite of your OneDrive. I wouldn't advise it, but you could do it. That's proof that it's okay. using SharePoint. Could you please discuss data privacy, i.e. data remaining, remaining within Canada? So this is all a concept that if this, uh, if you're uh, hosted anywhere, you know, if AvPoint's technology, which I don't think it is, is hosted somewhere that is hosted yep. only in Canada, would that be? Yeah, we do have a Canada data center just for that reason. Super, thank you so much. Uh, and I've got uh, Monia question. Is there a common approach to GC direction right now to use SharePoint over GC Docs or with GC Docs? And and, and I, I can answer that. And, and and I'd have to say it's not my my role to answer it. I don't I don't know that. Yes, if you ask Treasury Board, it is using GC Docs, of course, right? That's, a, that's the Canadian federal government um, direction and the Treasury Board policy. Uh, again, we would be able to help you with SharePoint, Teams, whatever it is, to GC Docs if that's the direction of your of your department. I think that's it, all the questions. I gotta say, John, that was fabulous. And just a reminder, if you'd like a, anything like a half day demo, or sorry, a demo or a half day planning session, reach out to Eric Hine at eric.hine at orangatech.com 
we'll set that up. Also, uh, there's lots of on-demand uh, resources, and we would also ensure that um, we get this both on, on uh, YouTube, as we mentioned, and we will send out the, the uh, presentation to everybody, a link to the presentation so that you can respond as we go forward. Everyone good? Thank you so much, John. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Avpoint. Thank you for everybody for dialing in. It's exactly noon and we I love to be right on time. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll talk to everybody again soon. Take care. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, John. Bye.